Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. Well, hello everyone and welcome to RV Talk Radio. And I appreciate you very much being here. A lot of interesting subjects we've been hitting here in the last couple of weeks. And uh, some of it's riled people up and some of it hasn't. And some of them appreciate it being bring up and I brought up. And, and I, I still have more stuff. And, and it's because the deeper you dig, the more you start finding stuff that's like really is stuff that should um, we should be aware of. So today's uh, another one of those kind of days of bringing up a subject that I, I love to hear comments. I love to hear the feedback. I really ask everybody to be professional. Try to keep personal feelings out of it and just address the facts of what's happening here and and um, um, hopefully we maybe come up with some solutions or ideas um, at least awareness and so uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, the rising cost of RV parks some of the causes of it how it affects homeless and um, how the housing industry is also doing it too and so, yeah, all sensitive kind of stuff, but it's stuff I just want to talk about. Once again, we always kind of focus on RV lifestyle. And uh, unfortunately, in some cases, RV lifestyle or or modular homes or uh, I should say mobile homes and stuff, <clears throat> there's a phenomenon out there kind of happening that's causing uh, issues that actually is enhancing our homeless um housing issues out there and and one of the root causes is um is rv parks and and not the rv parks themselves as it is the owners of the rv parks that are uh, causing a a, wow cause and effect kind of an issue and so i want to talk about that and 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 tell you a little bit more about what i've uh, found and what I want to report on. And then once again, I'd love to hear your feedback and ask you to pass this information along and, and be aware of it because it affects all of us as RVers. Okay, guys, let's see if I can make heads or tails out of some of this stuff. So based on some of the research, I actually ran across a video uh, made by The Guardian. And I'm going to put a link to that video on the in this description i urge you to watch it and uh what it's showing is there's people out there with money trying to do uh, make investments and then what they're doing <coughs> is buying up um rv parks and why is what they um what they're doing is you know a lot of people that live in rv parks are not necessarily just RV or travelers. They're people that have like park models and things like that in RV parks. And a lot of them are in fixed income. It's a great way to uh, uh, live with fixed income and uh, have you know a roof over your head and all the amenities of having a home and, um, and being affordable. So really what we're talking about here is affordable housing which is what's causing a lot of the uh, younger people buying RVs and living in them and full time, uh, either for careers or actually just traveling. And, and we've talked about that, nomadic living and stuff like that. And so this is just another twist on the whole thing. So these investors, and they come in on a busload and they actually have a tour and they'll go into these RV parks and look at them and see how uh, good of an investment they can be to buy them. And the, and the attitude is, all right, I'll buy this RV park for investment. We'll go in and, and, and clean up the park. You know, a couple of, you know, wash up some of the rigs, maybe uh, replace some fencing and paint a few things and all that stuff. And then raise the rent. <laughs> just, just that easy. 
So you you got to understand there's like people in there like uh, you'll see if you watch that video, there's like one guy uh, is on fixed income and is on disability and gets like $750 a month. And his rent, this, the live in a kind of a park model kind of place, is like 500 a month, which doesn't leave him much to live on. And these investors are walking through and the whole works and and, and uh, his rent's going to go up. And what's happening is we're taking people that have found a way to find uh, affordable housing based on their income, based off of either disability, social security, retirement, um, you know, whatever reason um, that they're on a fixed income, uh, even a pension uh, that's fixed. And, you know, if you retired 10, 15 years ago, or maybe you're, and you've now become 65 or so, and you get your social security, you get this certain number. And the thing is, is, as the years go on, your number doesn't change, but inflation does and costs do. And so it really affects aging people a lot and people with disabilities or mental health and things like that. The other thing they put an emphasis on is these mobile parks will say, well, let's declare this a sex offender park or people with felonies. Why? And the reason is, is first of all, they have a hard, you know, they have to identify themselves as a sex offender. The second place is nobody would want to rent to them or, or have them in their neighborhoods. So if you have an RV park and you bought it and fix it up a little bit and then declare it as, uh, say, um, a sex offender park and let them move into that and, in, and even some of these uh, park models and stuff, they'll break them up for more than one you know, family can live in them and uh, it gives them a place to live and two, believe it or not, they don't have that many issues at those parks because those people know they don't have any other place to go because they're not welcomed. So they tend to actually um, protect themselves or be um, rule, you know, live by the guidelines and rules of the park because they don't want to lose their living facilities because of how hard it would be to get a place outside of a park like that. The other problem that happens is as they start raising these prices, they're forcing people out. And and what's, you know, especially fixed income people, and that's where you might see some of these people living in vans and, and cheap RVs and stuff and maybe doing a lot of boondocking and stuff because they've been forced out of their areas. And they're on a fixed income and they're trying to survive. And the worst thing, uh, the very last thing that they want to do is end up in living in tents and and and, and uh, being homeless that way. So it's like a last resort in a sense. And, uh, and also there's people that are living in their RVs that are on fixed income that are living in these RV parks. And once again, it's raising the cost. So... Uh, so there's two things in these parks. You either own your your park model or you're renting it. So you'll have a double rent. You'll either have a, uh, a rent on your park model and the land that you're on, you, you have to rent. And so like what I used to hear is like a lot of people have park models. They can't own the property. They can only park it in a, a place like that. And it, and it used to be like around three uh, Thirty-five hundred to four thousand a year to be able to keep your park model. Well, now I'm hearing numbers like seven thousand, and these are just general people I run into. There's a lot of people with park models down here in Arizona. Anyway, so the cost is going up, and it's not um, you know, cost effective. It's it's not working as well as it used to. Now people with good retirement funds and and so stuff like that, um, they're fine, but. Uh, Typically, with some people with fixed income, especially if they've been there like five, ten years, those numbers really hurt. So we're causing, or this is one of the causes of homelessness and the housing issue that we're having in all of the different states and cities. Of course, one of the other big problems that's going on in all the big cities like Seattle or Los Angeles and California cities and here in Phoenix too is as industries like Google and, and Amazon, all that stuff, they're bringing all these people making over a hundred thousand a year, 
and causing you know cause and effect or or um, you know um, um, what's happening is the the cost of housing is going up to a point that is ridiculous even even if you make a hundred thousand a year the house uh, the rents are talking of twenty five hundred a month uh, on up and housing to be as high as four hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars or better for a decent home in some of these areas and it's even if you're making good money, like let's say you're making seventy thousand a year, fifty thousand a year, you cannot afford the housing, and you and then of course you know the rental properties are all it's all about investing and stuff. The more that there's supply and demand issues, the more that they'll raise the rents. Why? Because they can. You know, it's like all right, my place is full, and now you know you have attrition. And I know someone will rent my my apartments, even if I instead of fifteen hundred a month, I'm boosting them up to them say seventeen hundred a month, and people will rent them. And it's just, but those who can't afford it anymore are pushed out. They're homeless. They're, uh, you know, they just can't do it. There's even people that are working at Google and places like that, and are intentionally living in vans and trucks. On the side of the road, keeping their low overhead uh, down and and saving their money like crazy, which is you know in one sense you kind of go that's nutty. At this at the other way of looking at it is, hey that guy is putting a hundred percent into his four hundred one k that he can do a maximum and he's saving all of his money. He's young, and but he's living living in the back of a, a moving truck, and that's a fact. You know, this I actually saw that, and so um, anyway so. You kind of say, well, yeah, it's smart, but at the same time, you know, is that taking advantage? You know, so let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars or better from Google, and you decide to live in a van or live in a truck on the side of the road, pushing the limits of, of parking on the side of the road, which is causing all these RV uh, issues of of people parking too long in the cities areas. Now you're taking advantage of people that are actually homeless and are doing it because they have to. Where there's other people they don't have to, they're making lots of money, but taking advantage of the laws and the fact that other homeless people are living on the side of roads and are broke down RVs and they're not getting towed away because this is a fact. A lot of mayors are saying, let's not enforce towing these rigs away because it's better off these place these people have a place to live and have a roof over their head than us being the root cause of them being homeless and having to live in homeless camps that's a fact that's some amazing information to hear about so uh, for example there's a great video out there about the homeless and living in rvs up in flagstaff and people constantly going beyond just the one night thing at the walmart's up here Instead of enforcing the one night of a stay, there's people who have lived for years in the Walmart parking lots up there in Flagstaff. And the city was going to buckle down on it, but the mayor says, you know what? If we do that, all we're doing is causing those people more pain and hurt by forcing them out of the area or into homeless camps or to do more illegal things. It's better to let them live in their RVs in the Walmart parking lots than the alternative. And, and that's sad. But, you know, all this is all happening and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So what I want to do is, is also change the subject to how this affects us as RVers just being your casual weekend warriors or your full-time traveler. So here's the next problem that comes up with the, a good and let's say good growth in our uh, economy is one thing is happening out there because of supply and demand and all that stuff. A lot more younger people are buying RVs and you know as well as I do the reports out there are saying that there is record sales in RVs it's going on every year. And so there's more and more people with RVs, which means more people are using RVs and going to RV parks and camping areas and stuff. Okay, so the problem is now the RV parks are getting full. 
those some of these RV parks, uh, there's some other people I've talked to that have said, hey, I used to go to these RV parks that used to be, you know, moderately a couple of people in it. Now I have to make reservations. Well, what's going to happen is if you own a, and, and trust me, I mean, the best of intentions out there, but if you are a business person and you own an RV park and your RV park is always full, always full, and you're charging, let's just use monthly rates. Let's say you're charging 500 a month for someone to stay in the RV park full time. Well, and your place is packed. And maybe you're charging $35 a night for you know people that are just passing through. And it's always being used and it's always full. Well, you know, you're an RV park owner. You got responsibility, you got you got bills and things like that. I'm I think I'm going to raise my rent to 600 a month for the monthlies and $45 for the overnighters. And your RV park is full and people are coming overnight paying the 45. Not happy about it, but it's full. Well, crap. If you own an RV park, uh, I'm sorry, it's the American way. I'm going to start charging 800 a month for the monthly and I'm going to charge so let's go with $50 a night for someone that's this overnight and my park is still full but I'm hearing much more complaints and stuff and and I, I will keep trying to raise that rent to a point where I, 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 I feel the effects that maybe I won't get anybody in there anymore that's the American way supply and demand so all of us are affected by this growth and so I don't know what the answers are. It's like, do we try to make more RV parks? Do we try to make um, affordable housing um, where people can buy 10, 20 acres and invest in a lot of tiny homes and set up you know, uh, a low income, fixed income kind of a um, scenario for people to live in that have dignity and have a house you know all the amenities of a home and not be forced out in rvs and in in homeless living um you know tent camps that's one thing that is like can we do more of that what's you know why aren't we doing more of that and uh, of course you know uh, apartments and stuff like that what's the incentive of keeping a low-income apartment building when you can get top dollar for your apartments, why would you want to? I mean, I, in your heart, I could understand that. But if you're struggling as an owner of an apartment building and you know you can get twice as much by just investing a little bit in fixing up your apartments a little bit and get twice the, uh, the rent, why wouldn't you do that? Because, I mean, why would you live want to live in poverty or, or, or struggle when you don't have to as an owner, as an investor. So that's the sad thing about this whole thing is I don't see this ending. Maybe if we had another recession or a crash or something like that, maybe things would get balanced again. But, uh, you know, uh, what they're also saying in one of these videos with these investors is in the 60s and 70s, there weren't that many poor people as compared to today and so now they see this opportunity and, and it's like unfortunately the opportunity pushes out a lot of people that are less fortunate than us as far as income and our fixed incomes or have health issues or mental health issues and uh and taking advantage of the fact that there's uh people like uh sex offenders and have felonies and they need a place to live let's you know let's create a scenario where they're forced to live in my place and i have i can get the maximum rent out of them they have no other place to go i can do it so this is kind of a gloom and doom kind of subject because i don't see a fix unless cities recognize the fact that we need to allow investors to find a way to do things in city limits make it easier in the permitting process to buy 
you know, 20, 30 acres and set up a actual place that's designed for people with fixed income and have affordable housing available for them and actually give them the pride of having a house, you know, a key to their door, privacy, a place they can put their stuff. Everybody is entitled to that. Everybody should have that right. What are you saying? Well, these guys are, you know, uh, low income or unemployed and all that stuff. Well, a lot of them are got issues, mental issues, health issues, fixed income, vets that can't get jobs or anything. It just goes on and on and on of reasons why people aren't in the workforce. And, you know, you hear us do videos on the nomads and all that stuff and all, and there's this darker side of some people that are cheating the system, living on welfare and stuff like that. We need to be aware of those people. At the same time, there is people out there with needs and RV parks are an essential way for people to live within their means, having affordable housing. And now it's under attack. It's affecting not only the homeless, uh, people that are fixed income and, and forcing them into a homeless situation. It's affecting us as RVers too in the RV parks that we're using because there isn't, I'm not seeing a lot of new RV parks being developed. And now you hear this big debate of the RV industry wants to take on the tiny home industry. Well, great. Well, you know, but there's some practicalities of having pr uh, these tiny homes where we could set up, you know, neighborhoods of little tiny homes and create really nice communities for people on fixed incomes that, you know, um, could be a wonderful scenario. But I'm sure there's tons of is issues of why you can't do that. And I'm sure it has to do with city ordin ordinances, <laughs> sorry, and permits and practicality of, of septic and sewer and all those kind of things. Um, and yes, we need to create environments for sex offenders to live at. I mean, we got to give them a place to live and maybe even create a community to help them. And people with felonies or people who just got out of jail or on probation, they need a place to live. Well, some of us will say, well, they don't deserve it. They, well, they paid their price. They did their time. And there's, you know, we're supposed to, as a community, try to bring them back into the community. We also need to have that compassion. And me, you, all of us. And uh, pray that they don't, you know, fall into that kind of situation again. But if we don't help them, if they don't have a place to live and we can't give them jobs, then it's going to happen again. And it's our fault. And all this is kind of our fault. It's our politics. It's our greed. It's the f capitalism, the way it's built. There's got to be a setup out there that is semi-socialism, I guess. And I'm not a social. I'm so Americana, it's not even funny. But I don't see a solution unless we step in. And it can be private companies, but the governments also and cities and, and ordinances have got to give slack to people that can invest into the stuff and make it work where it's profitable for them. Well, who in their, in their right mind would start a business or own a property or, or buy apartments or fix up uh, tiny houses that wouldn't break even or make more money or, or at a profit? Because that's how we operate here. So we need to allow them to make money. We need to allow these people to have an incentive to create affordable housing, which also goes into the RV parks. Why don't we have more RV parks? They appear to be good investments. Why can't we expand to more of them? Why can't there be more RV parks in the Oregon coast? Why can't there be more RV? Why do all these RV parks have to be bought up? How many private RV parks are out there that investors are coming along and say, I'll give you twice the money that you paid for this place. 
Who in their right mind would say, no, I just love this lifestyle or get twice the money and go retire? Well, that's what's happening. That one company will come in and actually buy all these RV parks. That's happening down here in Arizona. Big problem. The same companies buying, buying up more and more and more RV parks and then fixing them up a little bit and raising the rent. <laughs> and all it's creating is more havoc, homelessness, and less opportunities for fixed income people to live at. I know it sounds bleak and I know it sounds sad, but we need to know about this. I urge everybody to go on the internet and type in RV homelessness or RV parks, investing in an RV park. Check it out. It's a true, it's a fact. I'm not making this stuff up and I'm not trying to bum everybody out. But the RV way of life that I knew back in 2006 and also recent, just two years ago, of full timing, is changing and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And then more people are getting to do this boondocking thing. Well, you know what's going to happen. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. More rules. More abuse. More rules. And then more rules. Pretty soon, in some cases, like for example, when I was a kid, I used to be able to go up in Weyerhaeuser up in, uh, and use the, uh, the mountains and go hunting and fishing up there and stuff. Well, I got abused so much. There was a handful of one, two percenters out there that ruined it for all of us. And now Weyerhaeuser locks up their gates and say, we don't want anybody in. You're leaving old refrigerators and throwing garbage in a place and damaging our trees and stuff. We're not going to let you do it anymore. And that could happen with BLM land and things like that. Because we're pushing everybody out of facilities that we normally would have used or they're just too full. And so and you can kind of see it in all the RV art videos now. Everybody's put emphasis on solar and boondocking and, and living off the grid. Well, the reason for that is the RV parks are too expensive. I mean, geez, $50 a, a night? That's a lot of money. I don't care who you are. So here's the first thing you're going to do with this radio show is some of you guys would be in denial. Some of you guys will say, Rob, you're just thinking about bleak. Or Rob, you're, you're making it sound terrible because you're not RVing anymore. And that's not it. What I'm giving you is insight. Five years from now or 10 years from now, you may hear this podcast and go, you know, he was on to something because it has changed. So what this insight is and I'm giving you is ideas. Let's say you're 50, 50 years old and you want to retire at 55, early retirement, and you want to do the RVing thing. You, you might want to chart, change it up a little bit to something different than what people are doing today. For example, maybe you uh, buy your own camping lot. There's RV parks out there that actually sell the lots and you could rent out those spaces when you're not using them. Or maybe there is places where you can buy park models and actually buy the property too. Uh, maybe uh, different kinds of memberships. What I'm saying is things are going to be, might make more sense to do something different in the future than what we're doing today. Based on the fact that if we do, you know, if you're trying to be spontaneous, it's kind of like the old days. When we used to go camping, it used to be like, I used to go camping in the uh, West, uh, Washington coast in uh, Claylock. It was always first come, first serve. To a point that it got so crazy that now you can only get in there for reservations. It could be you know, RV parks are going to change too or get so expensive that you're going to have to find another alternative. And, and we may find boondocking is either being spoiled or not um, being uh, utilized like we use it today. Maybe they'll change what's allowed for 14 days to be only seven days. Uh, all those things could be changing. So discussing this now may help with your plans in the future to maybe change your paradigm a little bit of maybe I should set up something or buy some property or, or do something a little different than just buying an RV and start traveling. Because then you're going to find that the cost of traveling in an RV, 
was just as expensive as, as owning a house, well, then what's the purpose? So other than the fact that you're traveling, I understand that. But what I'm hoping out of all this is you're getting insight to something to think about. It may be changing your paradigm to, you know, you're seeing all these videos right now. This is how I'm doing it. It's five years from now, it may be different. It's changed a lot in the five years for Sherry and I. Um, and definitely it's changed a lot in 10 years. So what's it going to be like another 10 or 15 years from now? And you're getting ready to retire and want to travel. And you want to watch your costs. I don't care how much money you make. Everybody should be watching their costs. Uh, I'd rather be spending my money on my own personal things than to be pumping it out for RV parks and, and fees all the time. So anyway, so hopefully out of this conversation we're having is knowing and being aware that the RV parks are investments to people. And uh, yes, there's greed. And yes, there's a, a, you know, people don't buy a business not to make money. Would you? Maybe you've got so much money that you'd buy a business that didn't make money. Uh, and that's okay with you. If you're doing out of the goodness of your heart, that's wonderful. But there's not a whole lot of people doing that. And besides, if you ever want to get rid of it, you, you better hope it's a profitable business. Why would anybody want to buy it? Unless they sell the potential of fixing it up and then charging higher rents and then hurt, you know, hurting people in a sense but uh, for their personal gain. And that's what's happening. So anyway, so my my big point out of all of this is if you're getting ready to RV and if you're going to want to do some of the things you're seeing on the internet, it may look a little different five years from now. It may cost much more than it did before. RV parks are going to be much more crowded. So what are some of the other alternatives? You know, buying a snowbird house, a place where you could park your RV when you're not using it. Uh, what's some other things? Maybe you uh, look at <coughs> going out of the country and going uh, to Mexico and doing caravans, things like that. There's a whole lot of things to look at other than the traditional just, I'm going to go down the Oregon coast and I'm going to stay out and find it. it's going to get one, very expensive, two, very crowded unless things change. And, and I'm hoping because of all this yakking about homelessness and all that stuff that when you look at the root cause, the root cause is, is supply and demand and greed. <laughs> and if somehow we can set up something where people can make <clears throat> RV parks affordable and still make a profit or make a park uh, RV parks um with park models and all that stuff to keep that affordable and maybe buying property where people can build a lot of tiny homes to help um, make uh, affordable housing for people. Until that changes, we need to know this is going on. Well, you know, we've been talking about the RV parks and the rising costs of that kind of stuff, but you know, there's gonna be another problem and I'm sure it's already happening is a lot of us prefer to buy a newer RV or a new one because one, it's just, you know, nice to have a new one too, is, you know, you get a good warranty and stuff. But the problem is supply and demand once again, is if we're getting a lot of these RVs on the road and they're coming out in the, you know, selling a million a year or all that stuff, that's just using a number, the problem is, is depreciation on these RVs is going to be even worse than has ever been. And and I, I'll be the first one to convince you, I'm underwater on my RV. But I'm not in a hurry to get rid of it. So um, uh, I financed mine for, I believe, 10 years. And it's actually going to, we worked it out. We bought ours at age 55. And by the time we turn 65 and we actually want to do some more traveling and we take good care of this fifth wheel, We'll still have it and it's paid off. But, uh, you know, it's going to be, a, if you played the numbers, it'd be a terrible loss of, of, of you know, a, a $70,000 RV that's going to be, if I ever sold it by then, I'd be lucky to get fifteen or 20000 for it. So, yeah, poor investment. And motorhomes can't be, oh, that's got to be even worse. 
And I can talk with experience because I've had RVs. I mean, I've had motorhomes. I had a new 2007 um, Discovery, and I've had trailers, the whole work. So I've had a little bit of each thing. And no, none of them has ever, ever been a good investment. And it's so easy. You can go from a smaller RV and move up to a bigger one pretty easy. But when you want to... Like Sherry and I were looking into actually going smaller now because our scenarios changed a little bit and can't see a feasible way to do that staying with new RVs because we're underwater in our fifth wheel. And that's just the realities of it. Should I have paid cash? Yeah, that would have been nice if I could. How many of you guys out there is like most of the people, have, you know, to get new RVs and get what they want and don't want to do all the repairs and stuff like that uh, we bought new ones and so typically we financed them and we're kind of younger older adults you might say so we still have room to do financing so that's the deal with that so the problem is is uh the more saturated the market gets the less you're going to be able to get for that rv uh it's a problem for me it's going to be a problem for you um Yes, it's always good if you're a handyman and have some uh, talents and skills to be able to keep up your RV and buy a used one, fix it up. Uh, maybe you can maybe break even. Maybe, if you're lucky. I don't hear a lot of people making more. And, uh, and somebody can even say, well, I made $1,000. I paid you know, 1500 for this and I sold it for 2000 Yeah, but he put you know, $3,000 worth of repairs in it to get that extra $1,500. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, they just, it's, it's, you know, personal math, you want to call it. <laughs> so anyway, so the big thing out of this whole discussion on, and on, on the future of RVing is it's not one to be bleak as it is be aware of it and change our paradigms a little bit for good RVing in the future. Don't get me wrong. Nobody loves RVing more than I do. I love RVing. Yes, I love the community i love the uh, meeting people i love the different places and the different towns and the different uh, every town and state's got their own kind of vibe and and uh, and it's no doubt the coolest thing in the world and once you get traveling in your blood it's hard to get it out but we also need to face the fact that things are changing and in order for us to enjoy them in the future because sherry and i will be doing full timing again uh and it's not going to be the same as the last time and it certainly won't be anything close to when we did it in 2006. so what do we need to do to make it one enjoyable and affordable and that's kind of what i'm bringing up in this conversation here i urge everybody i'm not done with the show yet but i want to make sure on all this is i love your comments and feedback i you know, if you got hate, there's no reason for hate. This is just adult conversation talking about a problem that's going to come up that if we change our paradigms and if we understand what's happening, we, or especially if you're going to be a new RVer coming in this, you'll make smarter or better decisions that'll fit the future. Uh, currently, the way things are right now, a lot of people are starting to hit the shock of, of the price of RV parks. <clears throat> and the price of RVs are going, getting expensive too. Not to mention, uh, servicing your RV is a nightmare because there's so many people out there now. There's a waiting list to get your RVs fixed. And uh, so, what do you, how do you handle that? How what can you do to make it nicer? What are things in the future like maybe buying property, maybe buying your own? RV space and then renting out when you're not using it. Maybe buying a park model that you own the property to. Uh, there's RV parks down here in Arizona doing that. And I was really shocked to hear that. Um, maybe uh, <clears throat> buying a little house that has an extension kind of garage kind of thing that you could put your RV in. And uh, say in a place like Central Oregon where I used to be. Uh, and that would be your kind of base. And then constantly go RVing knowing that you can come back to your base and and you could legally build a little kind of house like that that could accommodate your RV um, you know because the problem is with property is the ordinances of the cities and stuff they don't necessarily let you stay in your RV on your property um, they'll let you do it if you're building or something but 
uh, all in all, you need to have an actual structure. And a lot of places, uh, majority of places you buy property, you just can't buy property and, and park your RV on it. Uh, if there is places out there, out there, please let us know in the comments of where we could find properties like that. But I think it's getting real rare. And then the ones that are available are in places that you just don't want to live. <laughs> I mean, we're talking barren. And then and it's like, uh, wouldn't it be great to have property where you actually could put your utilities in there and have at least a septic and a, and a water system and you're set. I mean, you're in good shape. And electricity, a lot of people with RVs, I mean, you can get away with solar, even solar off of the RV and put it on top of a shack or something. I mean, there's a lot, of, or just use a generator. So, yeah, but the future is going to be different. And we all need to address it. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Well, just to make sure that you people don't think that, you know, uh, all things gloom and doom from the radio show and stuff, I am going to take the time to tell you all the things I really enjoyed about and still enjoy about RVing. And right now, our RV is stirred up at a central oregon and i've kind of told you this before because sherry's folks are uh uh you know having health issues and they're up there in age so we're keeping it on their property so if we need to go up there really quick we have a place to stay and it's right there and it works out good and we get free rent i mean yeah uh, so now when we go to our rv we're almost excited i mean it's like and I've said this before, it's funny, when you live in an RV, all you can think about is how to get out of the RV and go do stuff. At the same time, uh, now that you we're not in the RV all the time, all we can think about is I can't wait to get back to the RV because uh, it's this cozy. Uh, we have a cozy little fifth wheel. We love it. And uh, But when we were traveling, there was no doubt in my mind that you know when we sold everything the first time and went traveling and it was scary and all that stuff... Um, if I look back at any of that stuff, any regrets? Nope, not at all. We enjoyed our time. Uh, I feel sorry for those that are getting ready to do it or going to change it. It might get a little tougher. But all in all, um, even seeing the same places that you've seen other people go to, it's not the same until you actually go there. So if you saw someone do something on Seaside, Oregon, go there because your experience will be totally different than theirs. And plus, you have different enjoyments. Maybe you enjoy museums where other people didn't. Uh, maybe you enjoy the beach and other people didn't go to the beach that much. Um, maybe you enjoy certain kind of foods. and uh, You need to go to those places even though you saw somebody else go there. Um, that's a cool thing. Um, but it's really neat to get into the new environments each time. You can even go you know, drive for 100, 150 miles and find a whole different community and feel a different vibe, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. And, uh, and um, pretty soon you start getting used to change. Uh, a lot of people don't like change, but uh, maybe if you're kind of like shaky about things changing all the time, this could cure you. Um, but one of the other things I've always, uh, we realized right off the bat is we used to, you got to be careful that if you're going to go full timing, you don't want to, you want to get out of vacation mode and realize this is your lifestyle and stop and smell the roses. So one of the things that Sherry and I learned really quickly was take your time and spend more time at the places you go and, and don't pick up and go. A couple of reasons for that. One is you don't get a real feel for the area. Two, it's more cost effective at RV parks and stuff to be able to pay for weekly rent, rent or monthly rents. Um, and, uh, you know, the pick up and move is a pain. It's moving your little house on wheels. Um, it gets old and it, it gets kind of like, ugh. So sometimes it's just nice to be at a place and you have hookups and all that stuff to relax for a couple of weeks and, and go check out the little places because it takes time to find out all the nooks and crannies of a little region that you may have landed in. And so that's my biggest advice for you is get out of vacation mode and get into travel mode and living for the now a little bit and smell the roses when you're on the move. 
And if you want to keep things cost effective, you know, not paying those daily rates is very helpful. <clears throat> uh, if you're going to do the boondocking and stuff like that, Sherry and I had some uh, circumstances where it was wonderful. Um, the only bad part was starting, you had to go into that conservative mode of power and, uh, and water. And uh, if that's something you don't enjoy and don't want to have that, then uh, uh, you need to keep that in mind. Uh, but I can see in the future where the boondocking, if available, and it doesn't get taken advantage of and used wrong, if it's still available as well as it is today in a lot of places, especially down here in Arizona, lots of places, the boondock gets a little harder in the East Coast, from my understanding, and it's getting really hard up in Washington and Oregon. Um, that uh, either you got to learn how to enjoy boondocking and find ways to be conservative or uh, find a way to deal with this new growing trend of you know, lots of RVs out there and, and, and making, uh, some people are really good about making plans. And, and uh, unfortunately, me and Sherry sure, tend always been kind of a spontaneous. We want to just pick up and go and say, well, we'll go a couple hundred miles down the road and see where, you know, see where we land. Well, it gets harder and harder, especially if, you, if you're going to rely on RV parks. Uh, they may be full. Um, and there could be circumstances where if we don't watch how people are taking care of, uh, you know, doing the overnight Walmarts and Cabela's and all these other places, we may lose some of those privileges. And those privileges are very helpful to people that travel and need a place to just lay their head overnight uh, so they can keep moving on to their next destiny. So, yeah. Um, but all in all, I mean, the adventure of, 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 going to all these different places and then of course the big thing is uh people you'll know, hear over and over again is meeting people uh the community friendly um people just kind of accept each other as they are um you'll get a lot of new friends it's kind of a different kind of friendship you'll know people and then you'll end up going separate ways in some cases, you will stay in contact them, with them for a long time, and maybe you may not get to see them again. Where other circumstances, where you may run into each other in a whole other state somewhere else, um, but you'll 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 pick up a whole lot of new friends, um, and uh, so, you know, some won't be the traditional friends that you've had in the past. Um, and some will be, uh, you just never know. But uh, there's definitely that sense of community and the social aspect of traveling uh, is wonderful. But a lot of people, there's other ones that you ever notice uh, when you're out there RVing that just keep to themselves. They are perfectly happy kind of doing their own little thing and not being as social as other, uh, they're not social butterflies. They just, but they're still friendly. So yeah. Uh, if you end up staying in RV parks for a longer period of time, then you start picking up on the quirks of people, and then you may find that uh, it feels like you're just living in a regular neighborhood. Um, but when you keep picking up and moving, you tend to see the best of people. And, and, and uh, you know, everybody's got stuff that they do that probably irritates another person. And if you're around them long enough, you'd probably pick up on it and drive you crazy. But when you're traveling... Uh, a little different it's uh you get to see the best of people and about the time that you may be getting on each other's nerves you're moving on anyway so yeah but uh and of course all the different foods all the different regions all the different things uh traditions and cultures and things like that i mean lifestyle so different between washington people and say people down in new orleans or people on the West Coast as opposed to the East Coast. Um, different aspects. They look at the world differently. They see things from left to right. And you go to another place, they look at things that are right to left. It's just how it is with traveling. But it's always an adventure. And, of course, there's always that side of things of knowing about safety and knowing about problems that could come up. Um, and some people enjoy that challenge. And so... Um, you know, and that's another thing to consider before you come out here is, are you up for that challenge? And some people say, yeah, bring it on. He's like, can you handle it if you're, 
out in the middle of nowhere and you blow a tire. I mean, you gotta freak out or be able to just move forward and find a way to fix it. Or is it like, that's it, I quit, I'm not gonna be an RVer anymore. Strange things happen out there and it's part of the adventure. And so Sherry and I have always enjoyed RVing and always will, but even now we've had to modify our way of RVing quite differently than what we would have done five or 10 years ago. And Lord knows what, by the time Sherry and I are ready to go full timing again, which is in about seven years, uh, it could look a lot different once again. And so Sherry and I want to ask these questions that we're talking about of what's things going to look like in five years from now and what can we do now to adapt and be ready for it. Maybe it's a good idea that maybe Sherry and I uh, buy a lot or a camping spot up in Washington that we could go to and call our own and rent it out when we're not using it. Just thinking out loud. Or maybe I should buy, uh, uh, you know, we sell this house, we buy a park model, put money aside for a little nest egg or whatever. You know, there's so many things. Of course, there's, you know, how healthy, how, uh, how will we feel seven years from now? Uh, there's a lot of things, but once again, if you don't think about it, uh, what things could look like five or 10 years from now, and I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but it's, are you asking yourself those questions? Will I be prepared? And m maybe I should change my paradigms and do a paradigm shift of doing RVing a little bit differently in the future. Uh, so I enjoy it as much as Robin Sherry did 10 years ago or anybody else you're watching on uh, on the YouTube channels and stuff. And uh, uh, I hope that's where we're helpful uh, in, in making your RV experience better, knowing that these things are out there and these things are changing. And it's just like camping. Oh, my gosh. Camping has changed so much since we were younger. I used to just pack up the kids on a Friday night go to the coast and get a campground and we're good. If I did that now, my car, you know, we would have been sleeping in a car in some weird parking lot because you wouldn't be able to get in the campground. So things have changed and you've got to change along with them and, and instill to make it fun. I mean, obviously, i got to call ahead of time, make reservations, pack up the kids and go, and it's there. And we have fun. Well, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm pointing out is we want you to have fun. We want you to enjoy RVing. We want you to see and get a chance to travel and also realize conditions are changing. And uh, that's pretty important to know. So I do want to take the time to thank everybody for listening. I appreciate the feedback. No need to get upset on any of this stuff. This is a discussion. Uh, you remember the days when we had debate teams and there was a pro and a con. Well, sometimes we take the con side. Sometimes we take the pro side. Uh, doesn't mean that is exactly what we believe in. It's just we want to bring it up for discussion. If you have comments and feedback, we'd love to hear your feedback. Please be professional. Please don't be, uh, we're not trying to insult anybody here uh, as we are just bringing up awareness. And to hear your ideas, allow us to pass those on to other people. That's really what this is all about at RV Talk Radio. We're here for the lifestyles. So once again, thank you very much for listening. Uh, be safe out there. If you're thinking about becoming an RVer in the future, uh, I hope this is helpful information and another aspect to planning your full-time RV adventure in the future. And I hope we've been a part of it. We've actually gotten really good notes from people saying, hey, Rob, because of the information we've been given out, we've made such and such decisions to make our RVing experience better. So that's, that's cool. That's what we're all about. So thanks again. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you in the next episode. Be safe. For me and Sherry, we appreciate it. Go buy yourself an RV, guys. Bye. Hey, thank you so much for listening and watching RV Talk Radio. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Be safe out there, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.